Okay, as last we left off out on the machine, we were covering G0, G1, G2, and G3, and that's on part four. If you haven't watched part four, probably a good idea if you review part four before you watch this. This is going to be about the I and J values on G2 and G3 arcs that are greater than 90 degrees. Now, that may sound a little confusing, but if you break it down mechanically, it's not all that bad. Let me draw it up on the board and show you exactly what I'm talking about. An I and a J value with a G2 or G3 command are required on arcs greater than 90 degrees. So if you're just squaring off a corner, if you just have a corner of a part and you just want to swing an arc on that corner, no problem. Start point, stop point, radius value, off you go. G2, G3, it doesn't matter. But when you start getting beyond 90 degrees, you have to start coding it a little bit differently. Now what is an I and what is a J? You have in your line of code G2 or G3. We're going to use a 2 because I like to go clockwise. I like climb cutting. You have, these are your destination points now. This is not where you're starting from because when you got here, you were already arrived. So this is where you're headed. X value y value, i value, j value. What is it? x and y is where you're headed. I'm going to draw it up on the board here. And I'm going to try to do this as best I can because scale is really going to matter. Let's say you have a 30 degree feature and you want to round it off. Let's start with the construction here. You want to start here and you want to finish here. Now by construction, by geometry, the size of the tangent arc between two surfaces can be constructed with lines parallel to each surface at the radius value. That was a mouthful, right? Let's do this. Let's say this is your radius value. It's the same on this side. If you strike a line parallel to each of those two surfaces where those lines come together, that is the center of the arc at that radius that will connect those two surfaces. Also by definition, the tangent point is square. It's an awful lot going on there, but you can see that this, this angle right here is bisected by construction and you have two right triangles that are facing each other because if this is square, then this is square, there's your one triangle, this is square, there's your other triangle. It is this point here that is defined by the I and the J. Now these tangent points, when you look across, it is this triangle right here, and I'm going to color it in just so you can see it. This is the triangle that you need to figure out with your calculator, with your trig book, with your app, with your online chart, or wherever you're going to get your trig values from. This is the triangle you need to figure out. You cannot use the radius value here. Although it's present, it is not a true linear X and Y shift. Let's say my starting point actually for this construction, this would be the starting point and this would be the termination point. As the radius swings, that's where it ends up. Not fair to do that to you. Now the X and Y in the first sec section of code right there is this point right here. Okay, let's call that, I'm just going to give it a star because I don't want to call it anything and confuse anybody. 
So that's the start point right there. The I value always relates to the X and the J value always relates to the Y. Like when you say it, XY. Nobody says YX, everybody says XY. You're going to do the same thing with IJ. So just break it in half and there you go. XY, IJ. That's how they go together. The I value in this case is a positive move because if you're starting here and you're ending up over here, you have to go this way to find the center of rotation, which is right there. Linear. So you're moving over this far until you're on that center line. So this is your I move. And in this situation, the I move is a positive I. Because we're going to the right. That's the, that's the positive coordinates on the table. Move it to the right. Now the J move, to find the center of rotation, is a negative move. Because it's coming towards you. If you're looking at this part sitting on the table and the points back there, you're climbing that point coming around. The center is below the origin. So in this direction, this would be a negative move. These numbers are not just going to jump out of the controller. They're probably not going to be on the print. You're going to have to cat it out. You're going to have to trig it out. You're going to have to figure it out. But knowing what's positive and what's negative is really going to help. So look for that triangle. This is your I leg. This is your J leg. Piece of cake. <laughs> It'll be a piece of cake after you do it about 55 times and play this back about another dozen times and really soak it in. Alright, no easy way to describe that guys. That's about the easiest way I could possibly describe that to you and I hope that the construction makes some kind of sense. I'm going to zoom in on that for a second so you can get a better look at it. J value in this case is negative, the I value in this case is a positive, if we're starting from this side over here. If you were starting from this side over here, then the I value would be a negative because you're moving towards the negative X, and the J would also be negative. So there is not going to be a pattern of positive, negative values in relationship to the I and J. It's all a matter of origin and termination of the tool with the combined radius. One of the other things I'm going to share with you today is not necessarily a code technique. It is how to locate a part if you're cutting both ends of the part in the CNC and you can't have a positive stop because you're cutting both ends of the part and the stop would be in the way. If there was a stop, it would only be there for one part naturally because you would wipe it out when you came around with the cutter. So let's take a walk out to the machine. This happened to me. This is the technique that I use. If you use something different, by all means, post it in the comment line because I would really like to see how everybody else does it. My technique works pretty good. Let's take a walk and check it out. So your problem is you want to mill both ends of your part, but how do you locate a stop on that part if you're going to mill both ends of the part? If you want to mill the entire perimeter, naturally you can strap it down, jump the clamps, whatever, but for right now you can't set a stop on this part because you're going to access 100% of both ends. If you take a half inch diameter drill blank and put it in a holder, that drill blank can be used as a stop. With a simple tool call in your program, position that tool such that it comes down and it forms a hard edge. Load your part against that stop, tighten it up. Now there's two things that are happening right now. You know that the center of the spindle is exactly 250 thou from the end of the part, so when you do your calculations for your center or for your initial pass, 
you know that 250 thou offset right now will put the tool tangent to the edge of the part if you're using a comp type program. You can give this particular tool its own offset and call this position 00, zero and you don't have to mess with any pre canned programs. As the part continues, the stop gets out of the way and both ends of the part are now accessible for machining. By placing an M1 in your code, the half inch drill bank will sit there as long as you want it to until you hit the start button to initiate the rest of the program.